All right. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be kind of hosting tonight. Tonight our speaker is Mo Shanfield, who's going to be speaking on a various bunch of topics. The college runs with the following format. We first have a brief announcements period. Our speaker will then speak. We will then have a question and answer period where you will have questions to our speaker. And after the question and answer period, we have our infamous rebuttal period where you may sound off on any topic you like with a be high or off point. Let us give a warm round of applause to Mo Shanfield. Mo, you're ready to come on up. Your topic has changed a number of times, so I just figured you're going to come out and spout off, and uh, you, the, mic is, the mic is yours. In this case, I'm sure heckling will be encouraged. I'm sorry? Heckling will be encouraged, of course. Heckling. All right. Again, let's give another warm College of Complex applause for both. And I'll tell you why it's very appropriate in my case. I first spoke at the College of Complexes in 1955, and I knew Slim Rundin. Use the microphone. Me as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you. You'd think I'd be, I'd know that. Um, and uh, in 1957, for, for a few months, I, um, was, I, I, I was the chairman. I was ar arranging the speakers, and sometimes I uh, engaged in procrastination, and so Slim fired me. <laughs> ah, okay. um, I'm glad you, uh, Chuck, I met, I'm glad you mentioned... Louder, Mo. Uh, so, I'm glad you mentioned something I hadn't known, and that is that... Uh, there's likely to be an enormous fare increase, and even three or four times. Immediately, that tells me we've got to start organizing the poor, the aged, and the sick to go en masse onto the buses and refuse to pay <clears throat> at higher rates. And this will be the beginning. Uh, this will be a, a contribution to the civil war, <coughs> which has already begun. Uh, but speaking, of, I want my original idea was um, entitled Ego Imperious Infantile Orgasmic. Naturally, I'm talking about Trump. Uh -huh. And the subhead uh, would be, you know, ego at play with Nazis and nukes. Now, uh, the, good, the good part, the, the, the good news was stated by Mara Elias on the NPR today. Um, she, she put, I have a theory that it takes me 10 minutes to explain. She put it into six words. She said, Trump would rather tweet than govern. <laughs> and I think that is absolutely true. Uh, and I can explain, if I was originally going to psychoanalyze Trump, but there's too much else happening. Even as I was preparing the speech, we had the uh, Battle of the Bulge, which was a counterattack by German forces. This is Battle of the Bulge II. The Third Reich is not over with any more than the uh, conspiracy uh, of the people who did all the lynching, the enslaving, and the oppression of the blacks. That's not over with either. We are facing the Third Reich's attack again. This time, uh, it's been set back. It no longer has the Panzers, the Germans, and the Luftwaffe, um, but it has uh, some uh, well-armed people. We've already killed one, one American at least. Uh, is, the, is World War II over? With uh, Americans being killed by Nazis in the street? and a Quisling in the White House. Everyone know who Quisling was? When the, the Nazis occupied Norway, they found a Norwegian fascist named Quisling to be their puppet leader of Norway. Uh, he was I don't know, but he was probably executed after, after, after the war. 
Um, <clears throat> one of my points was going to be that Trump is the logical, inevitable conclusion of capitalist individualism, which has been destroying society for the last millennium. Uh, Max Weber put it very succinctly in uh, the uh, the, the Geist des Kapitalismus und der Protestantische Ethik, the, the spirit of capitalism and the Protestant ethic. Very early in the book, he defines the spirit of capitalism. And it is this, that whatever decisions you have to make, you make on the basis of profit margins. So if you have uh, one possible business or investment here that has a certain profit margin, and another one that has a higher profit margin, you forget that one and go to this one. Now that sounds very businesslike. And it's, what's the evil about that? Everybody wants to win, especially including Donald Trump. But the danger comes in when the capitalist individualist attitude and, and, and the basis of, uh, becomes the basis of society and culture. And this, and this is, uh, this was told to us by one of the great prophetesses of the modern world, a woman who had great insight into what is going on, Margaret Thatcher, who said, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, there is no such thing as society. Ugh. What does that mean? It means, first of all, in her mind, that all decisions, moral decisions, religious decisions, political decisions, economic decisions, will be made on the basis of, of profit margin considerations. The individual who is constructed by this is a trump. And we each have a trump within us. That, that's how come he got elected. And I'll tell you, I'll start with myself. Way back in college, and for some years, especially in college, I was a liberal Trumpy. Is it possible to be a liberal Trumpy? I'll explain how. From childhood, I've always been concerned with truth. And in, in the, uh, using truth for the salvation of, of humanity. And I had one of the sweetest girlfriends I ever had. She was a sweetheart. She cared about people as individuals, and of course she was a liberal. And this was at Roosevelt College in 1952. And, um, and she had a, a lot of respect, maybe a little love, for me, because I was the liberal editor of the school newspaper, writing editorials against McCarthyism. And I got into a conversation with her about um, some social political issue. And she happened to mention the phrase social reality. And I immediately shot back. There is no such thing as social reality. I didn't realize it, but I, I was, I was uh, 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 anticipating Margaret Thatcher. I was saying something equivalent to her. I was on a, a funny kick based on uh, materialism. But where I was coming from is not the important thing. The important thing was I brought her to tears. And even more important than that, I didn't care. I was concerned with the truth. That is the Trump attitude. The only difference between me and Trump was I was a little bit more logical <laughs> than he is. Um, in years after that, by getting into reevaluation counseling, I found the human being in me, and now, um, there is nothing more important to me than the feelings of other people. And I proved that a few years ago in my friendship with a homeless black woman who would hate it if I was, if she knew that I was talking about her. I won't give you her name. Uh, I remember one night sitting, at about midnight, sitting on the, uh, on the bench in that park on Howard Street, just uh, Outer. East, he just east of the L. Thank you for helping me out that way. <laughs> Sorry, I just... Yeah. Um, and I saw more fear expressed in her face 
than I've ever seen in any human face, including uh, uh, in the movies. Her fear was stimulated by the fact that she had been harassed several times by the police. They were in the habit of doing that with her. My guess is because she, she was so good looking and dressed in a slightly sex, sexy way. They, whether they really believed she was a prostitute or not, they wanted to get her off the streets. And when they arrested her, they took her to uh, Belmont and uh, Western, that station there, kept her overnight. The next morning, they didn't charge her. One time, they let her go without her money, without her ID, without her shoes. She had to walk uh, in her stocking feet from uh, Belmont and Western to Howard Street, where she was hanging out at that time. Well, anyhow, when I saw this fear on her face, nothing was more important to me than assuaging her fear. <coughs> If I had had that attitude with my girlfriend at Roosevelt College, I never would have uh, bullied her with my, as it happened, incorrect theory. Um, so what I did, I'm, I'm in uh, public housing for seniors. My rent is pretty low. Uh, it's, it's about 25% of my income. But I know, and I knew then, that uh, I could bring in a live-in aid, A-I-D-E, -E. if I got a letter from a doctor, and I've got a lot of doctors at the VA, Weiss Hospital in St. Francis, uh, saying that I would benefit, my condition means I would benefit from a live-in aid. So I got a letter from a doctor, and I got the CHA management to admit this woman to live with me. And she, that was maybe two years ago. She's still living with me. Um, she is sometimes the most difficult person I've ever met in my life. Uh -huh. And at other times I see her expressing tremendous joy. Sometimes she does a dance in praise of daddy. That's me. And I, it isn't so much that uh, I am benefiting uh, from being uh, praised and loved by someone. The greatest benefit to me comes, well, first of all, when I see her dancing like that, I say to myself, if she were homeless, she wouldn't be dancing. I would hate to see the joy that she often manifests. It'll cancel. And she has said to me, if I don't want her living there, she'll uh, she, she'll volunteer for homelessness. I don't want that to happen. What is this Emily Lewis from? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Because she was abused as a child, she is pretty neurotic. And she is a, a, the worst tyrant, she, I compared her to Trump in this respect. She can misuse logic to make me look wrong on any subject. Well, it's usually uh, whether I've cleaned up after myself and so forth and so on. She keeps the apartment uh, cleaner than the hospital emergency room. She does my laundry, she does the cooking, and uh, often she's uh, uh, fairly joyful. Pardon me, I dropped some papers. Incidentally, when I drop my cane on the L, inevitably someone tries to pick it up. Louder. Inevitably someone picks it up for me. So I'm going to be saying that we, this, this is a society, society of increasingly dehumanized people, uh, and maybe the champ of all that, Donald Trump, but there's plenty of us here. Um, people who pick up my cane are showing they want to be human. Now, I, you know, I'm an old guy with a cane and a white beard. Um, but I'll give you another example from Chicago history of maybe a year or two ago. Some of you may, may recall that um, there was a guy who was held up in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven. And the, 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 the mugger slugged him or hit him with a gun or something, and the guy fell to the ground. I guess he was unconscious. But oh, he didn't merely fall to the ground, he fell into the gutter, that is, into the street. There were seven other people present, and I don't know how many minutes it was before this poor guy was run over by a car. 
That was the end of him. None of those seven people could bring themselves uh, to go over and pull this unconscious body back onto the sidewalk. Now, I bet one of those people was, or more, at the same time, there are people who uh, would pick up my cane. So people are not all bad, but you're, you're, people are in competition to associate with the prestigious people of the society. I have a little prestige with a white beard and a cane. I'm someone worth dealing with, and besides, they don't have to touch my body. The guy lying in the gutter reminds them of drunks and God knows what all else, uh, diseases, maybe he's got fleas. Ah, we don't want to touch him. As I say, one of those, probably maybe three or four of those, um, or probably, I didn't, every one of those seven people would have picked up my cane. But not one of them tried to help this guy out of the gutter. Uh, they probably didn't realize that he could be run over. He's lying in the street. I think uh, I am painting the picture of a society far more dehumanized than the medieval peasants. Possibly the ancient Romans would rival us in dehumanization uh, in Rome at its height and as it was falling. Uh, certainly the ancient Israelis and Babylonians, if you study those civilizations, people there were more human. The Neanderthals, I could make a speech about the Neanderthals. Um, the Ubangis, the Iroquois, the Pygmies, you name it. Western capitalist society promoting the idea of individualism, the individual as a calculator of his, the benefits he can get from a relationship they got a, be a benefit from picking up my cane. It's an easy benefit. You're helping this poor old guy. You've got to uh, 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 get a plus mark in heaven for that. And you didn't have to touch his body and so forth and so on. Um, but when it comes to someone lying in the gutter, uh-uh. Or in the, that there was a song that I think uh, they used to play in WFNT about lying in the gutter. In any case, um, that is where we have come to. Now, in particular, the Nazis have done us a great favor of exposing, um, not only, yeah, of exposing how America is on the brink of moral bankruptcy. Where, from whence does this moral bankruptcy stem? stem? Because America from 1618 or 19 when they brought over the first black slave, and when they uh, were simultaneously killing the Indians and taking their land, uh, the, the Puritans you know, started out cooperating with one of the Indian tribes. And that tribe had a, uh, a rival tribe, and they wanted to attack them. So the Puritans joined with that tribe in attacking this other tribe. And the, the, the Indian allies of the Puritans were absolutely appalled by the uh, killings by blunderbuss that the Puritans were executing. <laughs> the Indians, when they fought wars, had very few fatalities. Their wars were not like our wars. That's another manifestation of the greater humanity of uh, primitive peoples. So the reason that America is morally bankrupt is that we failed to apply the law of conspira criminal conspiracy against the slave kidnappers, the slave owners, the slave traders, the uh, Indian. But of course, we couldn't, because that was the way this country was built. So we have a history of um, failing to um, prosecute our major criminals. It would be as if we had given uh, the mafia a complete pass. But this is much worse than the mafia. Uh, the millions of people who died as a result of our genocidal policies toward the Indians and the blacks, uh, actually, the number is much greater than the number of people we killed in the wars we fought. This 
country is based on a criminal conspiracy which has been in existence at least since 1619 and is still in existence. Now we could, we could reform ourselves by doing something very simple. Actually, it has some complexities. When the, I'm going to send a letter to the police chief of Berkeley, uh, California, where the next Nazi demonstration is taking place. Now they are they're going to do the same thing there that was done in Boston. And that is, they're going to keep the protesters and the counter protesters separated. And uh, Boston had uh, very little violence. Uh, that's good for preventing violence. But the demonstration by the Nazis and the KKKers is a manifestation of a criminal conspiracy that has been in existence, certainly at least since the Hitler's rise in Germany, and since the first slave was brought over, the Nazis and the KKKers have gotten together and merged their criminal conspiracy. Now, if you know the law of, of, um, of criminal conspiracy, you don't, the person you arrest does not have to actually have committed a specific crime. For instance, um, oh, I'll give you a marvelous, and I was going to give you an example of the mafia. When the mafia gets together to plan something, even there, if all the guys in that room are guys who've never committed a crime, which is theoretically possible, uh, they're guilty of a, the crime of planning a crime. And that plan can go on for five years, ten years, or a hundred years. It's still a criminal conspiracy. And I want to give you an example from my history and Chicago's history. I was one of the protesters in front of the Conrad Hilton in 1968. Um, and uh, Louder, the, the, a policeman's club got, oh, I will say, I, my humanity saved me. The first cop that came, they had us penned up, uh, uh, penned up against the plate glass window. I think it was called the Hay Haymarket uh, Camp at the corner of Dalbo, uh, Michigan. And uh, the cops had us penned up, ready like cattle for the slaughter. And uh, they, they came at us with their clubs. Well, the first guy who came at me, um, I'm amazed. I'm a scaredy cat. But sometimes when a situation gets into a crisis, I get very calm. And that's what I did with him. And I looked him in the eye. And I did, I say, don't do this, you're un-American, or some damn thing like that. I said, oh, I was just passing by. It made no sense whatsoever. But I had made a human contact with him by stating something calmly and by looking him in the eye. He passed me by and went to hit somebody else. That's the value of humanity. The next cop, his club, his arm got caught in a tangle of arms, just barely grazed my skull. Okay, that's not the important thing. The important thing is the cops were giving a treatment to us peacenik demonstrators that they don't give to the Nazis. But I am not going to ask for vengeance. I'm not asking for vengeance. Uh, ven vengeance would be, uh, okay, uh, you, um, you uh, attack and club people. A friend of mine uh, got a fractured skull and when they took him to the hospital, would you believe the police attacked him in the hospital? I, ca I can't even concede that. Um, the police were clubbing each other. There's videotapes of that. And Go uh, Governor Walker, who was a lousy governor, but a much better investigator, issued a report. He had a committee uh, in which you could call that a police riot. Well, why don't we have a riot against the Nazis? You have a riot against the peace. Because what that means is this society is uh, more concerned to be able to go to war than to uh, protect its minorities. But here's, here's the topper. After the uh, demonstration that, uh, was over, and after the election was over, that was the election that uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, uh, he, he had retired, and uh, Hubert Humphrey was running against Nixon. And uh, uh, incidentally, 
perhaps some of you have heard Tom Hartman's tape of uh, Lyndon Johnson talking to Senator Edward Dirksen. If only we had some Republicans like Senator Edward Dirksen, um, in which they both agreed that uh, the Republicans, or Nick, maybe Nixon in particular, were committing treason by uh, calling the North Vietnamese and telling them not to make a deal with uh, the Johnson administration, because when they get elected, they'll give them a better deal. That was treason. That directly resulted in additional American casualties. That was uh, helping an enemy of the country. OK. Um, so it was probably uh, sometime in um, 1969, ap probably after uh, Nixon was inaugurated, that uh, the federal government <coughs> indicted seven of the organizers of the Peacenik protests at the Democratic National Convention. Some of you, I'm sure, uh, Pat, I know you have a firm recollection of that, and maybe a lot of the others of you do too. Um, so they took these seven guys and put them on trial in front of that judge who was not a Jew, he was a he was, he was a goy. Uh, he didn't believe in justice, which uh, the Jews believed in. Uh, some of you may remember that. Now, that action of uh, charging political demonstrators with, um, with a criminal conspiracy to create a riot and a violence, that was legitimate. In principle, it was. It was not a violation of their rights. They were going to have their rights in court, presumably. And if you don't get your rights in court, you can appeal to a higher court. So there's a whole mechanism for uh, assuring people's rights. Where the, uh, where the failure, which was deliberate, of course, came in was that the prosecutor, who the hell he was, um, and the judge failed to look carefully Yes. or at all, into the fact, as uh, Governor Walker's report later revealed, to, lo <laughs> to those who didn't have eyes to see, that the riot was caused by the police. That was uh, Governor Walker's uh, description. It was a police riot. I forget the name of his report. So they, they were charging the wrong people. But it's entirely legitimate to charge someone with criminal conspiracy, now it later turned to the, uh, you know, Judge, uh, whatever his name was. Julius uh, Hoffman. Huh? Julius Hoffman. Julius Hoffman. Yeah. Julius the Just. Yeah. <laughs> Julius what? Julius the Just. The Julius the Judge, yeah. Um, the Just. He found him guilty. They appealed and later a higher court reversed the decision. Well, justice was done. I say that is the justice which should, should be done to the Nazis. That's what I'm going to say to the um, chief of police of uh, Berkeley, the uh, uh, state's attorney of that county, the attorney general of the state of uh, California, the, uh, the governor of the state of California. When those Nazis appear, they're clearly members of a criminal conspiracy, which have been pursued for years uh, through the, uh, the Nazi parties and KKK, and this is only the latest manifestation, it's very simple. You just arrest every single one of them on a charge of criminal conspiracy that does not violate their right of free speech, as they are contending, any more than the, the right of free speech was uh, violated by charging the Chicago 7. However, illegitimately, the charge was it is a standard legal procedure to uh, prosecute people for criminal conspiracy. The Nazis, the KKKers, and anyone who joins them is guilty. Now, Donald Trump made a point which I think may be true. And that is, uh, among the Nazi and KKK... Louder, uh, um, Yeah. Uh, uh, among the Nazi and KKK demonstrators, 
there may have been some old Confederate patriots or something who are not, not maybe, I think it's possible to be uh, uh, charmed by the Confederacy without being a racist. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm charmed by the Confederacy. You know, the Confederacy was more virtuous than they're given credit for. Uh, maybe that's another speech. Um, in any case, um, if a robbery is taking place somewhere as a result of a conspiracy, like in that movie with uh, Sterling Hayden and Sam Jaffe, there were a group of criminals, that, interesting different characters, uh, plotting a heist. And eventually they got caught. It was a very clever heist. Uh, even at the point where they're plotting that heist, assuming none of them ever committed another crime, they would still be guilty if the police had heard what they were cooking up. They would be guilty of conspiracy, criminal conspiracy, and they would be arrested immediately. So I'm going to advise, which I'm sure they won't do, and this, that every one of those Nazis, as individuals, whether it's a thousand or two thousand guys, be arrested for criminal conspiracy. Oh, no, I was going to say, if you're walking down the street, and you, you see uh, Sam Jaffe and the Sterling Hayden uh, robbing a store. And you never met them before, but you go and you join their robbery. You help them. And you don't even get any money from it afterwards. You walk away. You have become, you have become part of a criminal conspiracy and are equally guilty with them. Uh, just as. Um, Guy who, uh, there, there was one guy in Chicago. In, uh, Mo. The mic, please. Mike, please. Mike, Mike, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who drove some friends of his to, to a 7-Eleven. Um, and they were in there. And they were there for a while. And he claims he didn't know what they were going to do. And they went in and robbed the 7-Eleven. And then he came back. I don't know if they told him what they had done or what. And eventually he got arrested, too. He was part of that conspiracy, even though he didn't know it. The law of conspiracy can be very sneaky once you allow yourself uh, to cooperate with the criminals. So even those Confederate uh, sentimentalists who were in, uh, which I doubt that there was any pure Confederate sentimentalist um, in the, uh, the, the, the march of the Nazis and the KKKers, um, even those guys uh, are guilty of conspiracy by cooperating with this latest manifestation of the Third Reich and the KKK, both of which are crim were criminal organizations. The war is still on in both cases. The United States is about to, I've become aware as a result of all of this, that the United States is the most bankrupt, morally bankrupt, uh, venture in human history. Well, maybe maybe the Nazis. Okay. Um, our whole system has been based upon genocide, and we have not we have not done uh, two percent of what we could do because every slaveholder should have been arrested as a criminal conspiracy. Every Ku Kluxer, everyone who even even if they didn't Louder. string up, even if they didn't string up the poor black guy who was being lynched, the fact that they participated in the crowd made them part of a criminal conspiracy. Um, perhaps there's no one here who's guilty of criminal <laughs> conspiracy, but the people who run this country are a bunch of criminal conspirators. Um, I will conclude by saying that the, the revelations of doom, of uh, St. John and others in the Bible are being fulfilled. And the way they are being fulfilled is, uh, was illustrated by an essay written by Garrett Hardin in the environmental uh, movement of uh, the 60s. Maybe some of you have a vague recollection of that essay in which he says, Christianity uh, laid the groundwork for uh, capitalism and the exploitation of nature or God's creation by saying that 
mere matter was not holy. There was no spiritual life in mere matter. There was only spiritual life in the soul of man and woman, and of course in God himself, which means license was given by Christianity, most streams of Christianity, to the ruthless exploitation of God's creation. And uh, that's just another evidence of our moral bankruptcy. And the good news is, as a result of all of this, um, as a result of the, the Civil War and the racism, which is a, have begun, uh, our violence right now, our level of violence is comparable to the level of violence in the, in the United States, uh, in, perhaps in the 40s, if not the 50s, with bloody Kansas. All of this, uh, uh, which proves the total moral bankruptcy of the entire uh, American uh, legal, political, economic system, is, is gonna, the good news is it may lead to our doom before global warming can ever do it to us. Thank you. <laughs> you're, taking, you're taking questions now, my what? questions now, right? Oh, questions. All right. You answer questions too? Yes. Okay, go ahead. If the United States is so morally bankrupt, what country would you consider a leading example of Well you know what country that would suggest? Well then let us know. The State of the Canadian countries. They're part of first of all. They got over the, the Viking jazz, see. Uh, now maybe they should have paid reparations to the English monasteries that the Vikings destroyed. Here's the mic. Uh, Here's the mic, man. A thousand years ago. But uh, they seem to have gotten over that Viking urge. And right now, um, in Sweden, um, every mother and child is given support by the government. They don't have to prove that they're impoverished. They could be rich, and the government still pays them, I don't know, five or six hundred dollars a month. Uh, there is, oh, Tom Hartman. Does everyone know Tom Hartman? Yes, he's on, yeah. on RT. He's on RT. He's one of the leading, leading progressive he is a smart radio guy. talk show hosts. He was visiting Denmark some years ago. The guy, really, the guy really gets around. Use the mic. The guy really gets around. Um, and he was talking to a conservative Danish politician. And in the conversation, Mike, um, uh, what, what, what is Hartman's first name? I forgot. Tom. What? Tom. Tom. Oh, Tom. Tom. Tom Hartman made a reference to people um, going bankrupt because of medical uh, expenses in this country. Um, 50% of the personal bankruptcies in this country are due to really <laughs> ridiculous medical expenses. The Danish politician said, what did you say? He repeated it, and the Danish politician was amazed. He's a conservative politician, mind you. He said, nothing like that happens in Denmark. Of course, they've got single payer. No one has to spend money on uh, most medical expenses. Not medical expenses. If you want plastic surgery so you can look like Marilyn Monroe or somebody, uh, maybe they don't pay for all of that. So there's a further evidence that there are some more humane. Oh, Finland. In Finland, when you violate traffic laws, they don't have a set fine and say, well, you were speeding uh, in excess of uh, so many miles an hour, uh, we could, we're going to charge you $200. No. They say, we're going to charge you uh, maybe one half of one percent of your total income. If you're a millionaire, it's a major loss. If you're a poor person, not much. That's an example. Those are just little examples of why Scandinavia is um, more humane than the United States. What more questions for Mo, please? Yes, sir. If the United States is such a uh, morally bankrupt uh, den of iniquity, morally why bankrupt, does you say? den of iniquity? Oh, den of, why well, did I, so I many of our that. ancestors end word. up here? I don't accept that word, den of iniquity. Well, okay. So if we're so morally bankrupt, why did so many people? Most of us are descended from people who came here voluntarily. 
Sometimes they had to get out of wherever they came from rather quickly, but they came here voluntarily. They had other choices, but they came here voluntarily. If we're so bad here, why do people keep banging down the door trying to get in? Why don't they pick someplace else like Canada? When the major immigration took place in the 19th century and up to World War II, use the mic, Mo. When the major immigration, here's the answer to your question. When the major immigration took place in the 19th century and up to World War I, that's when millions and millions came in. The United States was considered a Pacific country. We were past the Civil War, and the United States was not considered an imperialist country. We didn't have a draft, which half of the European countries did. And people thought, for one thing, they wouldn't have to serve in an army. That's just one thing about the United States. The United States also was capitalizing on the great capital investment which had been made in this country by the uh, 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 Native Americans and by the labor of the blacks. Indeed, the White House. How many here know that the White House was built by slave labor? Anybody know that? Yeah. Old story. Well, more of you need to know that. But incidentally, justice would be done not by tearing down the, I don't want to tear down the Confederate statues. Justice would be done by uh, creating uh, 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 carvings or statues of black people dead with wounds, and it's maybe some live ones like the famous photograph of the guy, his whole back is covered with scars from the whippings that his master gave him, and surround each, gap, each Confederate general uh, with statues of all these bodies lying there. And that would be a real history lesson. Okay, next question. Yeah. Are you familiar with the fact that the Luftwaffe has bases in this country? The Luftwaffe what? Has a base in this country in New Mexico? And no, I'm not familiar with that. The Luftwaffe has a base. What? <laughs> yes, they, uh, they train with the Air Force. Oh, oh yeah, the present German Luftwaffe. Yeah. Um, oh, that's not too surprising. What about it? Yeah. Charlie. Yeah, the phone is there. Uh, what? Bundeswehr. Yeah, the army. Bundes. No, the whole military yeah. goes into that. So what's the uh -huh. issue? Any other questions? All right. Charlie back here. Yeah, Charlie. Yeah, Mo, in the directory of associations in the United States, there's about 200,000. What was that? There's a directory of associations. Oh, yeah. And it lists about 200,000 uh -huh. associations in the United States. Yeah. And you're going to come along and declare that anybody, and I don't even know what membership means. I belong to at least a dozen or two dozen oh, yeah. organizations on. myself. Yeah. And suddenly, I'm going to get arrested? Probably not. Which uh, one of those 200,000 organizations are, are not allowed? I'll tell you why you're not going to get arrested. I know damn well you're not a member of the Nazi Party or the KKK. Uh, you're a member of a labor union, right? But whatever, I think you're a member of mainstream organizations, whether they're right or left. A prosecutor who is really the determiner of who is arrested, a prosecutor doesn't want to waste his time. If, if one of your organizations had done something, and one of your organizations that you belong to had done something weird, something racist or whatnot, your connection would be so remote and the incident would be so minor. He's got plenty of Nazis and KKKers and Mafia and other conspirators to, um, to prosecute <coughs> centuries before he should get to you. That's my answer. Follow-up. There were complaints that Obama went after some organizations during his he, administration. He was doing what? He went after. Oh, yeah. Shut them down. And they were, and I'm not going to get into the case, cause, yeah. but he was stood accused of selectively, they were political organizations. Yeah, conservative. Yes. And he was seeking the internal revenue, supposedly. Yes. That. And that, I, I, I have no way. Are you doing the same thing? What? 
Are you conceivably doing the same thing? Am I what? <laughs> doing the same thing. Um, it may well be true. I, I'm not that happy with Obama. Uh, he, 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 he is actually, Obama and Hillary are more dangerous than Trump. With Trump, what you get, what you see is what you get. With them, they're pretending that they care about blacks. Under uh, Hillary's husband, uh, new laws were passed that uh, re-enslaved a million blacks. But much worse than anything Donald Trump has done. Uh, Obama Thank you. Uh, pretended to do something about global warming, and he was extending a five-foot pole to a man drowning 100 feet away. What he was doing, even if, even if the Republicans uh, at guest sessions or somebody uh, doesn't uh, repeal his executive orders, he was, he, he, he like a, a Judas goat, was leading all of us sheep to ultimate destruction by global warming, and that's why um, um, uh, Stephen Hawking predicted that, he just predicted it a few months ago, I heard him on the BBC at 1 o'clock in the morning uh, on WBEZ, he predicted that, but it was mentioned at a previous meeting, that, and I don't know what the time factor is on this, whether it's going to be in 50 years or 100 years, he predicted that the Earth would go to a temperature of 350 degrees, um, and that the oceans, of course, would boil up. But not to worry, there will still be rain, just it happens that the rain will consist of sulfuric acid, which is the condition of the planet Mercury. Now, whether Mercury ever had a good climate or not, I don't know. But the fact that Stephen Hawking did give us a four-year window of opportunity, what he is saying is, we've got to do a lot more to prevent this. We've got four years to do it. And what that is saying is that what Obama did was completely inadequate. And, and sure, the Republicans were trying to block him. If he was sincere, if he really wanted to stop global warming, despite his corporate master's interests, he would have said to the country, Here, here's my program. And I, as it happens, I, uh, 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 I enunciated uh, a program that would actually have worked in the last 10 years since I enunciated it on Channel 11 to mobilize uh, American manufacturing as in World War II, but not to manufacture guns, tanks, and planes, but to manufacture sustainable energy systems and electric cars and so forth. Um, Nobody picked that up. A friend of mine who is really technically expert says to me, a hundred years from now, the historians will say, I was uh, perhaps one of the few who suggested a solution that would re really be effective. Obama's solutions were nowhere near that, and he was more dangerous than Trump because Trump is not pretending to solve the problem. We know what we've got. Uh, uh, Obama had us completely fooled <laughs> with regard to race and with regard to the um, uh, global warming. If we're getting down toward the end of the questions, uh, what about uh, getting ready to go to rebuttals? And uh, want to give our speaker a good hand for tonight. And All right, so, uh, Let's get the rebuttals. Oh, you can sit down. Yeah, you get a free beer whatever you want. Yeah, for free. Yeah, it's worth it. You're a paid speaker, Mo. Yeah, absolutely. That's what, according to Stephen Hawking, I'm not a scientific expert. He's the scientific expert. Okay. Okay, this is the famous uh, rebuttal period at the College of Complexes. So, if you, whoever wants to give a rebuttal or say a few words about the world situation, raise your hand and keep your hands up so I can get an accurate count. And Charlie's going to be the first speaker. I just want to reiterate the schedule change. The timer on. I got the people were late. Oh, I just want to reiterate for some of you who don't, who seem to have forgotten that we start at six o'clock. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, seriously. Uh, there's a slight schedule change. 
And next Saturday is our open microphone on whether or not Trump uh, has made America great again or should he be impeached to save the nation from destruction. That's open microphone. That's going to be tuition free because we don't have a speaker. Followed by September the 2nd, the Labor Day weekend, and we've got a really uh, Cracker Jack Labor speaker lined up. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, once again, raise your hands and we'll get a count uh, for rebuttals. Uh, keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, out there, five, six, seven, Charlie's nine, and eight, ten. Okay, uh, we can go four minutes for everybody. Uh, who's the first speaker? Tonight? All right. Who had a hand up over here? Go, go. Okay, come on up. They can't afford to buy a ferry, it costs too much. Uh, well, no, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, you're about the first guy that I've heard here that has a much worse opinion of the United States than I do. Uh, I go with the idea, apparently you may not go with that idea, of Carl Schurz who said, my country right or wrong, when right to be kept right, when wrong to be put right. So I had the choice through my whole life, since I had a little money, I earned it all myself, uh, thanks to all the taxpayers here of the state of Illinois, but I could have left the country. But I stayed. Uh, I really don't agree with you, Mo, that our country is that bad. I think we're one of the great countries in the world. And uh, I think we could be a lot better. I agree to that. I also agree that the uh, idea of slavery tainted our country right from the start, right from what you said, 1619, when they brought the first slaves to the United States. So uh, we've been in trouble since that time, and we've done a lot of other uh, things that weren't uh, good, but we've also done some things that were good, and I think most of the people here will remember some of the good things. They won't, some of us won't remember the bad things, not only slavery, not only the fact that even FDR put 100,000 Japanese in the prison camps. Incidentally, he didn't put many of the Germans and, and uh, Italians in the prison camps. Isn't yes, that did. strange? Yes, uh, he yes. did. He put some, but not 100,000. You're right. He put a few, but not nothing like 100,000. It was not equivalent whatsoever. Not whatsoever. And we uh, grabbed half of Mexican territory from them in a very unjust war, and I heard, I think it's Eisenhower's son, John Eisenhower, who is a historian at West Point, saying that was one of our very worst wars. We've done some great things too, and I don't need to uh, repeat them because you all know that you got it from your uh, celebratory U.S. history. I read a lot more history than that, and I know that we did some terrible <coughs> things too. But I think, Mo, I disagree that your this country is that bad. I think it's a great country, and uh, I guess for the rest of my short life, I'm going to try to make it better and improve on some of those things you talked about. And I agree that the United States uh, kind of ought to be ashamed that Germany has Ang Angela Merkel now, and we have Donald Trump. Think about that. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. oh he's not going to make a great trade again? That's right. What? Yes, he is. Is he going to make a great again? No. Yes, he is. So he's going to incite violence as a way of making things better. great.
inciting violence is a way of making You know, better. what really kind of makes me a little bit sick as an American, and what really kind of gets my gall as an American, we are still probably one of the last bastions of free speech, freedom of choice, and freedom of religion. And I honestly think that we're getting soft as a nation. We're getting to be nothing but chronic complainers. True. And we don't want to do a thing about it. We just rather sit back and complain and watch our freedoms get eroded by those who do. And if we get taken over by the so-called fascists, it will be our own damn fault. For when evil, for good to prosper, evil men must be kept at bay. Our greatest, our greatest asset is that we have done this before. We have rose up to challenges. We have rose up to do great things. We put a man on the moon. We won World War II and in the same time helped secure the peace around the world for many, many years. We helped defeat communism in 1989. And 90, I'm sorry, 91. Without firing a shot during the Cold War. Now, we are great as a nation now because we are trading with other nations. We are engaged in commerce. And the two greatest exports that the United States gives the rest of the world is one, security and security on the high seas. There's not a ship that can move. There's not a country that can do anything without the implicit consent of the United States Navy. And we've chosen to keep the sea lanes open. The second thing the United States can do to stay great is to keep the goods aflowing meaning a free trade agenda, meaning a fair trade agreement with other countries, and that basically means the spread of capitalism worldwide. Well, Charlie, you know, there's a lot more jobs created in China because of Walmart and in the United States because of them around. What I don't like about Walmart is the sense of corporate welfare they get by tax breaks. And well, you can be happy they're shutting them down. Uh, the thing Walmart? is, though, all of them. Yeah, get them Walmart, yeah. For oil and Walmart. Chinese, all of them, yeah. But the thing of the matter is, is that we do have other companies coming in. Now, recently we've lost sight of our capitalistic system. We've gone into what Adam Smith calls mercantilism, where everybody at the top gets special favors and stuff from the government, and the people in the middle get to pay the bill. If you really want capitalism, you get rid of the special favors for those at the top. You open up competition, and you'll see a flowering of the economy that cannot be contained. Now, as for you, it's going to take involvement civically. Get yourself involved in a local church or synagogue or protest group. And I have to applaud the one thing. Last couple of weeks ago, we had people on board who said they impeached Trump. They're organizing. They're getting their things together. There are also other Republican organizations also getting together for support of Trump. The point of the matter is, finally, we may be getting we may be getting engaged politically which means we may still be able to turn this country around. I think uh, what makes the country great, it's not so much as government, it's the people that live in the, in the country. Yes. And what I mean by that, everything we ever got was caused people went out there and, and put on stripes. During the Depression, they went into the factories, like in Flint, Michigan, and they occupied the factories. 
and people marched, and a lot of people, what they were doing during the Prussian years, if somebody was put out by the state or the city, and all their furniture was taken out in the street, and their gas and their water was shut off, you had certain left-wing groups come in, move them back in, put on the water, put on the gas, and what happened was, during the Great Depression, Roosevelt thought there would be a revolution in the United States if he didn't do anything. And he looked at Russia. Russia had something like 14,000 communists, very small amount. And in the United States, they had about 100,000 communists. And he was fearful that capitalism would be overthrown. That's why he brought in the New Deal, put people to work on the Tennessee project with the dams. And he done this mostly in the big cities. He didn't help too many um, minorities like the blacks. He didn't help them very much. And we've always used them as a form of scapegoating, just like the Jews. Were the, were the scapegoats in Europe. Same thing. And if you look at the march that happened recently with the uh, Ku Klux Klan and the Nazis, they were wearing guns. And some, I don't know how many of them, maybe rifles. But they were armed. Could you imagine during the strikes in a lot of different factories in the United States, those workers carrying guns, you know what they would do? Beat them up and throw them in jail before they even get started. And, and like you said, shot them in the back sometimes. So we do favor fascism, just like in Germany, if, we, if, the, um, if the country is in the Great Depression, who supported Germany, who supported the Nazis, were the bankers, the industrialists, and the Junkers. The Junkers. The Junkers were big land-holding farmers. They were very reactionary in Germany. So, so if you look at the, any country in the world, like you look at Norway, you look at uh, Sweden and other countries, it's about 85% that belong to unions. That's why they have the good results that they do. It wasn't so much that the government gave it to them, it's because the unions were very strong and they're the ones that made the demands. And the same thing here. When people make demands, and there's no other way to go, then they get some progress. But now we're going backward. People make, what, 7.35 an hour? 11. Nobody can live on that. 11. People, there's maybe 30% in the United States that are doing well, and the rest are going downhill. So they're very scared that something might happen where these people will revolt and that's one of the reasons why the fascist government, semi-fascist government that we have in the United States, most of them will go to total fascism. All right, next. Raj Patel. Let me get that back. Let me get that back in my pouch. Turn it up a little bit, Charlie. All right, next. If, if we do think that we are a good people and others are bad, then we got to sow it. And one way to say it, the Bible says, love those who hate you. And uh, I don't hear much of that. 
you know the those white supremacist people they have a right to speak their mind they were right to get together they were right to hold rally and uh, i don't think uh, i think this would have been allowed to do without any interference I mean, uh, we disagree with them, and we have right to disagree with them. We have, to, we have right to criticize them, but they have the same right as we have, and they should be allowed to exercise their right without any interference. Now, I'm not. I I sympathize with the people who oppose them. I sympathize with people who fear them. I sympathize with Jews who who fear them, and who are speaking out very loud. You know, but look. I mean, Jews are not perfect either. Christians are not perfect either. Hindus are not perfect either. We, they all have a problem. Okay? And, and we cannot use those excuses to hate or disfranchise people. That is wrong. Now, we have problem, and uh, I will agree one thing, that we are doing very well in, in America. Yeah. And you know, every single country, they have pride. They love their country, and they are trying their best to be better. I do not hate any country, because people on the world, they have better opportunity, they have better ways to be improve their lives, they have better way to love each other, and they are doing it. And the world is getting better and better and better. In America, murder and violence at lowest level, in spite of your problem in Chicago. People are eating better everywhere in the world. More people have a job, and more people have a way to associate with the other people. And I see this in Africa, you know, I see in the Middle East. Middle, Middle, Middle East, I want, I want to say something on Middle East. I think it's America's responsibility, America screw up the Middle East. Yep. Middle East had no problem. Yes. America screw up, yep. and when America helped Israel, we did not tell them that, look, you have been treated badly and we are going to help you, but you cannot hate other people. You can to treat them as well as we treat you. Because we are not saying that and that is creating a problem in the Middle East. We love, we are not telling them we love them. Korea, we are never going to have war in the Korea. We can afford it. Do you know something? China is never going to go away. If this guy goes away, the dictator, bad guy we say, then China will take it over. China do not want us at their border. Let's be very clear. And if we, if we attack and that guy goes crazy and then South Korea is a city they attack, the guy says there's 100,000 people or more than they will die. And do you know something? What people will, what will say? America did this thing happen. Yeah. And America will be the bad guy. And everybody will remember for hundreds of years. Oh. That will never go away. Just that, like, just that. Like. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good time. Okay. okay. Stay calm and carry on. We were inside. All right, next. All right. Does anybody have anything good to say about Trump? Yeah. Yeah. That's my uncle. Really? <laughs> and Uncle Bernie and Uncle Trump and all of them. All right. <laughs> Uncle Except Sam. Hillary, I disown her. Well, you, you, she gonna come up and talk? You're gonna give a rebuttal? <coughs> no, no. Okay, come on, we want to hear a Trump. We want to hear it. You don't hear him too. All right. Yeah. You're yeah. Here, yeah. You can't Bro, be Trump next, race. but you can be. Now <laughs> yeah. you can be next. As long as you don't tire of me. We're not going to tar and feather you. It's, it's a free speech yeah, forum. You can talk next to oh, him. You got four minutes to say your piece. All right, keep going. Person coming. Okay, so, you know, it's too bad that um, I just think Trump is surrounded with a lot of bad people. I mean, I think as uh, progressives and Democrats, it's our job to get him on track. I think he would get things done, but he's not an idea guy. He's just, you know, a bully. <laughs> so, and he just gets these bad ideas, and I think he came to the realization now that Bannon is just, you know, bad ideas, you know, so he's fired. And then, uh, 
He's you know, he's got his people. daughter and that other, that, that uh, slumlord kid, Kushner. The Jew. Whoa, okay. I can say it, I'm part Jewish. All right, you're next. <laughs> well, let me finish, Andy. Yeah, uh, keep going. All right, so I think it's our, our job to make sure he has better plans, because I don't think Trump really planned on being president, still. And he just has some uh, rough ideas, and uh, hopefully he'll uh, get weaned off his own bad idea. I mean, we gotta, you know, I think we should have all the countries in the world have their uh, military budgets and put that to infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, we spend a trillion dollars a year on military, War Department. Okay, now it's half. And then we're going to call China up and say they spend, you know, a half a, billion, a trillion dollars on military. They got to spend 250 billion. So I think, well, and then we, and then we can use that money for infrastructure, for education, for development. So, so that's a problem. Military. The other problem is uh, oil dependency. We have to get on oil. We have to build much better uh, uh, bicycle uh, highways. We have to build. Uh, transit systems in every major city. We have to build electric bullet trains, of course. We have to get off of oil. Trump's not going to do that. You know what? He he might he his forte is building stuff. So we don't want him to think about politics or government. We want to think about him as an infrastructure builder and business guy with getting ideas. So I think it's the job of. Uh, Democrats and progressives to get Trump starting to think about better ideas rather than racism and immigration and guns and all these tired subjects, my God. So, building walls, what the hell is that going to do? You know, big, big effing deal. So, um, you know, Trump is a bully and you just got to use that, uh, that attribute, you know, to kick ass, you know, and that the Republicans, it's been proven that they don't know how to govern. They, they're bumbling idiots. And so Trump would kick their asses. And I don't think Trump really likes Republicans at all. So I would think, you know, maybe Trump will, you know, turn on them well, and then maybe Democrats will come up with some ideas, who knows where they're at. But um, I, I don't want Mike Pence as president. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, get out of here. All right, next. I'll take it. I told me I can't blur it out, but he can blur it out. Here's what he told me. He said, don't be blurting out. They lose their train of thought, but he can blur it out. That's that Charlie's exempt. Andy, let's give this lady a chance and we won't you blurt on her. No, you, 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 you said I'm blurting out, but he blurts out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 If you have something to say, yeah. come up with yeah. 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 No, 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 forget it. No, I lose a train of thought. No, forget it. Stop it. Can you guys just stop it and move forward? We have a different opinion here. And then the term progressive uh, means to a lot of people common sense things that both sides can agree upon. Like we don't want our children to die because we can't afford their medical bills. That's a progressive view that both Democrats and Republicans from both parties will agree on. Uh, if you take away the party affiliations and just look at issues, probably 85 or 90 percent of all Americans are on the same page. Yep. But we've allowed the media to divide us into so-called two groups, Democrats and Republicans, when we have a lot more pressing issues where we have things in common. So I, I'd like to make a couple of quick observations. For number one, did anybody, let's have a show of hands here, who saw the picture of Donald Trump on the front page of the Sun-Times the other day? Big picture, it said, fake president. <laughs> the, the, that's the first newspaper article to come out and say it in broad daylight. Donald Trump is not the president of the United States. He's in no way, shape, or form qualified to be in that office. He's a corporate criminal, carnival barker, 
that was installed to play act the role of the president while the real dirty work is being done by the billionaire corporate criminals behind the scenes that are eliminating all, all rights to clean air, clean water, uh, roll back the uh, you know, uh, rules on asbestos, mercury, lead pollution. They want to get rid of all controls on industry. The progress we made toward a clean environment and a better life for everybody in the last 80 years. They are in the process of rolling back those laws right now where Trump is providing a total circus cover. And one of Trump's advisors, a long-time advisor, said he's not going to wait for them to impeach him. He'll, he'll just resign and declare victory and say he's done his bit for the country and let the next man step up. There's uh, speculation in Washington that Trump is going to resign uh, sometime before Thanksgiving. So in any case, his, he's going down and it's only a question of when because business is deserting him the way big business deserted the effort for the Vietnam War. Once business turns against it and said this is bad for business and bad for America, then we got to change. So, All right. number two, Jim Mars wrote a book called The Rise of the Fourth Reich. <laughs> and he said, picture all those Nazis that scattered into the wind after World War II in different countries, the ones that weren't prosecuted for their crimes. Picture what would be like if they were silently coming back into another country and, and, and creating a fourth right. He said, well, you don't have to imagine that because it's happening in America right now. The Rise of the Fourth Right by Jim Mars. If you want to know what's going on there, take a look at that. From Tom Hartman talks about this all the time. No Republican has been gotten control of the White House in an election without massive treason and criminal activity since Eisenhower. The only way a Republican can get control of the White House is through massive criminal activity. They're not voted in by a majority of Americans. We did not vote Trump in. He lost this election any way you slice it, and they changed the vote totals of the electoral colleges after we went to bed to push him over the edge. The need, um, Don Ritchie announced a couple weeks ago, he said he saw two, uh, two movies, Detroit and Inconvenient Sequel. That Inconvenient Sequel about the environment is the best thing I've seen in 20 years. And it's being blacked out by the media because it's a giant wake-up call. So, one final thing, there's an article on Common Dreams. Everybody should, if you're interested in news that matters, log on to the website Common Dreams. They said, don't pay attention to all this hoopla about North Korea having missiles. That's a sideshow. Uh, if, if a bomb explodes in an American city, it's not coming in on a missile that can be launched through the air. It will be brought in a boat and then delivered on the back of a motorcycle. Nobody in their right mind since 1985, every country that has nuclear warheads or something and missiles, nobody in their right mind is going to fire a nuke on a missile because once it goes up in the atmosphere, all the satellites pinpoint right where it came from. It's committing suicide to fire a nuclear missile at any other country that has nukes. And so there we are. Uh, if any of you want to understand what's happening in America, get a copy of that one book that I mentioned, Bush and Cheney, how they, how they ruined America and the world. It's about the destruction of our political environment, that the real title? environment. What? The title, book is Bush and Cheney? The title, it's back there on the floor, too. The title of that book is called Bush and Cheney, How They Ruined America and the World, and it's by David Ray Griffin, Professor David Ray Griffin. He started ISIS. So, yeah. Who's next? Next, All we right. up. Charlie. Okay, go ahead. I can't believe that Charlie Kirk is going to be talking about this. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, for America being the strongest country in the world uh, economically. Uh, so we don't want to throw the, bat, the baby out of the bath, bath water, uh, but rather uh, put some controls on capitalism that will uh, uh, focus it and, and aim it at the interest of a broader number of people. Obviously now you've got CEOs earning 300 times what the workers work. That's totally insane. Uh, billionaires, uh, we don't need billionaires, okay? We don't need billionaires to provide the incentive to innovation that uh, capitalism works well with. Uh, it can work on much, uh, much lower amounts than that. And a, a, a good tax system would be uh, the, the thing that would handle this and, and bring it together, in my opinion, better than any other, other way. Uh, I believe in, in uh, minimum wage and various other uh, laws like that, but none of these will have the positive effects that a, uh, a well-focused tax system to encourage innovation uh, would have. Uh, so if capitalism is the problem, what is it, democracy? Uh, I don't know that democracy is the problem, I think democracy run amok contributes to the problem. I think we have democracy run amok in this country. Too much money in politics, too many uh, lifetime jobs, uh, too much influence peddling, uh, and, and many other things. And if we could take care of some of these things, get the money out of politics, uh, that alone would help a lot, I believe. Uh, so actually, I, I stood up here and agreed a little bit with Tim, which doesn't happen all that often, but, but I do. Uh, and as far as Trump goes, again, I've said this before, why did Trump get elected? Most, most of the Democrats, I hang out with a lot of Democrats and political people, they, don't, they still haven't figured it out. It's, it's, it's the anger on the part of voters, the feeling that, that government isn't doing what it should be, that the government is disconnected. Even, even the Democrats, even the states and cities and so forth controlled by Democrats are not serving the people well. They're serving their own interests well. Uh, they're worried more about re-election. Even, even the good guys are more worried about re-election in many cases than they are about uh, serving the people. Uh, so we need, to, we need to correct that as well. Uh, as far as uh, uh, impeaching Trump, yes. Uh, I think that probably Trump will not pull out, uh, finish his term, whether he resigns or is impeached by the Republicans or by the Democrats, we don't know yet. From the Democrat standpoint, it would be better if he were not impeached until next year during the election season, because nothing will help the Democrats more to win seats at every level all over the country than having Trump sitting there in the White House tweeting away. Uh, so I, and I'm afraid the Democrats, the, the Republicans are going to figure this out and they're going to chop him out of there uh, before next uh, election season. But we'll see how that goes. At least it's interesting. We wake up every morning no, not wondering whether there's going to be a great news story. We know there's going to be a great news story. We just don't know what it's going to, what it's going to be. Uh, I will end. Uh, by, I, I wore my hat tonight to remind everybody, if you haven't heard, Ken Burns has come out with an 18-hour, 10-part series on Vietnam. It will debut on uh, 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 public TV on Channel 11, uh, September 17th. And if any of you want to see Ken Burns in person, he will be at the Auditorium Theater on September 7th. And there will be a short preview. I saw a short preview of the film today. It looked pretty good. Pretty What's it called? Pretty, What's uh, it called again? Handed. It's uh, Ken Burns, Vietnam. Okay. And where's okay. it being held at? Uh, Auditorium Theater on September 7th. I think it costs 25 bucks to get in. But you get to see the man himself. Okay. Thank you. What? She didn't want to. I didn't change it. Next week, by the way, is our open mic. You can blurt out all you want next week on Trump or against him next week. Um, I'll be eclectic as usual here. By the way, I met Mr. Burns several times. I was got a girl that was an academic who taught film history. Um, anyhow, I'll be eclectic here. I'm, one thing I want to start about, it's kind of interesting week, all these things about statues, taking them down, 
things like that. A lot of you don't know that I'm hung around Santa Fe, and they were going to take, they want to take down the statues of the conquistadors. <laughs> so we get rid of the elite and those filthy conquistadors who came down on the indigenous people of the Southwest. I still like it. In one place, they, they, they didn't take down the statue, they didn't rip it down, they tarred and feathered. <laughs> Bobby Lee. <laughs> uh, let's see, all right, we'll leave the statue thing alone. Uh, what's this not? It's about the United States name. I've got to pay for our tax money. It's got to go to get the sea lanes open so we can get some plastic stuff made in a sweatshop by children in China? Is this your promise so I can get plastic stuff? Yes, Charlie. Cheaply just, made by children. And that's so just the United the States Navy, next time I run into a sailor, I say, thank you, acres away, you know. It keeps the pirates open. down, Charlie. <laughs> uh, oil, oil regarding oil. energy, yeah. uh, oil Mo, I've heard this from the senator staff, and, they, and in particular, every week, some guy or a gal shows up to an office of the United States Congress, and they say they've got some gizmo that's going to solve the energy needs of the United States, and they want money. And they said, we are not engaged in venture capital. You know, keep that in mind, you thorium guys. You want government money. You know, this is, some guy shows up and says, here's my... Actually, we had a guy who had a device like that. Ed Ponder spoke here. Remember, Ed, he spoke here a couple times. He had a device that could take old car seats and convert them into gasoline and stuff. <laughs> uh, by the way, regarding infrastructure, the Republicans are not, they, they are want to burn fossil fuels, uh, oil, gas, and coal. They don't, they're not going to spend 10 cents on infrastructure. So you can forget about that okay. one right away. Regarding organizations and associations, uh, <laughs> you must realize that 100 years ago, an organized labor union was considered, and this was the term, it was considered a criminal syndicate. <laughs> criminal syndicalism was against the law in the United States. There were no unions in the city of Chicago in the year 1900. Uh, regarding declaiming or organizations, against the law. I've got to wait a minute. I've got to think about that for a minute. Now, are street gangs against the law? Are these crazy militia groups with those who think you've got a right to possess weaponry? Are they, are they, uh, what about underground societies and things like that? Uh, degrees of association. I think you did kind of cover that, but um, declaring, we do have a freedom of association here. The college complexes, I think, should be declared unlawful. Found <laughs> at the top of my list. <laughs> the things I, some patriotic things said against the president of the United States. You know, revolutionary topics, wanting to overthrow the government. We're going to be the first to go. So be careful about uh, our uh, outlying organizations. All right, see you next week. Save up on your stuff. All right. Do not be so upset. We're here and have a good time. All right. As long as it goes my way. You're a friend my way. All right, Mo, get ready for the last word. You know, as I look around here, week after week at the College of Complexes, I'm pleasantly amazed at what a remarkable country we are. <laughs> We allow the likes of us, not only in the country, but to gather in one place and openly discuss stuff that there is absolutely no question if we carried on some of these conversations in most other countries, we would have at the very least been hauled down to the police station for re-education and probably sent to some very, very unpleasant places. Many of us are here because of the fact that we had relatives, ancestors, who chose to come to the United States because the country that they were in had proven intolerable. People do not pack up and leave their home country unless they're really pressed to do it out of desperation. In my own case, 
uh, a certain Patrick Butler in the early uh, late 1850s, early 1860s, came to the United States because he had uh, killed a British official, supposedly, according to family legend. And that's a no-no. That was a no-no over in Victorian England. They looked down on that. So much so that the penalty for that was death by hanging. They didn't even bother sending you to Australia. They hanged you. But this gentleman who supposedly did that got a knock on his door from a friendly policeman and said, Pat, you'd better get out of here tonight. There's a capital warrant out for you, and they're going to pick you up in the morning. And that, if he hadn't left, and if the stories that I've been told, uh, you know, down through the years are true, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. You know, I wouldn't be. But fortunately, uh, another Pat Butler was able to get on a boat, able to come over here out of the reach of the British Empire. Now, the United States is a country that has many faults. We are a work in progress. But I challenge you to show me another country which is as tolerant of our many errors and eccentricities that you will find here. Now, you mentioned the Scandinavian countries, and uh, I am Norman Irish, which means I am distantly part Scandinavian. And I am often reminded of the part that used to appear in the Roman Mass. Deliver us, O Lord, from the fury of the men of the north. And they were not the people of Atlanta who were in fear of the blue coats coming from the north. They were in fear of the Vikings who later settled in a part of France called Normandy. Those of us who are of Norman Irish extraction, that's how we came to Ireland and thence to the United States. The point of the matter is, we're all here because we come from countries which couldn't stand us. <laughs> most of us would be most of us would be in jail. I mean, Chuck, you'd have been up before a firing squad a long time ago. I might have been able to talk my way into uh, life in Siberia, but that's about it. You know, we've got we've got we've got other people here who they wouldn't even bother to haul you into the station. Boom, boom. <laughs> Were they one of the few countries in the world? where if you have a vision, if you have an idea, no matter how crazy it is, they don't pick you up and send you to the asylum. If it works, you can find very often people with money who will subsidize that. And you too, you know, can become very, very fortunate. It doesn't happen all the time, but I defy you to try it in places like Central America I defy you to try it in places like darkest Africa, and I defy you to try it in parts of Europe where everything is run by the state in some of the countries there. Okay. We have a lot of work to do to make this country what we want it to be, what we expect it to be, what our forefathers expected it to be. But we don't move a step in that direction by constantly tearing it down and saying, oh, we're the worst country in the world. I think if we really believed that, those of, uh, those of us who are here who really make those complaints would have been on any of the planes, trains, or buses, or boats, you know, leaving for other countries. There are no, there are no guards at the border that are going to say you can't leave this country. There are a lot of countries, though, where the guards at the border will tell you you can't leave Rostovia or whatever country you want to talk about. Um, we have this freedom because of our imagination. We have this freedom because of people like us. Because people like us have at times not been afraid to stand up to tyrants. We did it in 1776. Some of our ancestors did it in 1916. Other countries have done the same thing. And I, I, I'm getting the uh, yeah. and uh, which means if I don't shut up, I too will disappear to a very, very bad place. Thank you. You're the man. Well, I agree with um, the last.
recipe right now. America is not all it can be, but it's definitely not the worst. It's definitely not as bad as America as it can be made out to be. Slavery. The interesting thing about slavery is slavery has existed since uh, the Phoenicians, since the Hebrews, since the Babylonians, since the Egyptians, since the Greeks, since the Romans. Yeah. With people and slavery have been around forever. The thing about slavery in recent times is it was industrialized. And that was something new. And that's what the Europeans, Industrial Revolution, and we were a part of it. The industrialization of slavery was indeed a human and a crime. Um, okay. Oh, Jesse Owens. Okay. Take the American experience. Take Jesse Owens. Try to think about what it takes to take a black sprinter, qualify for the Olympics, send him over on the Olympic team to Munich, have him run against the Germans. <laughs> you don't know if he's going to win. <laughs> he does win. Well, oh, thank you. It was Berlin. So you don't know if he's going to win. And he's, but you send him over as a rep. You send him over because he turned out to be the best you got. And it's like, you know, we live in a country that has a little bit of everything. It has people who hate and people who don't. And for many parts, but not all, we live in a government, with a government, that lets things happen, things unexpected. Ooh. Now, let's think of famous Africans from England, or famous Africans from France, or famous Chinese Africans, or Indian Africans, or African Africans, or Italian Africans, or Spanish Africans, or how about American Africans? Oh, yeah. There are a bunch of rich, famous, well-respected American Africans. And so in comparison, when you compare like this country's performance with others, it's like, you know, it's so easy to criticize. All right, thank you. All right. Okay. Molly, the last word. You get the last word, Mo. Our speaker gets the last word. If he's ready, we're running a little late on time tonight, so, so keep it quick, uh, Mo. If those of you can uh, begin to evacuate your tables right after Mo uh, gets there, because we're supposed to be out of here by quarter to nine. We got about eight minutes. Okay, Mo, you ready? You don't have to give the last word, Mo. We can just close it out now and give you a big round of applause. No, I didn't tell you that. Take all the time you want. Okay. Use the mic, Mo. There were a couple of speakers who came close to some of the things I was saying. Ernie, for one. Um, I'm not sure who the other one. I forgot who the other one was. Pardon me talking. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you have all been seduced by what remains of uh, American prosperity. Um, you are someone who's saying, uh, talking about how wonderful this country is. How come our health, uh, our average health is the 27th in the country? How come we have in the world? 60, in the world? Pardon, what? 27th in the world, you mean? 27th in the world, the quality of our health care and, and the outcome. Oh. How come 60,000 Americans died of uh, drug overdoses? Mostly white people. The average life expectancy of the white male has been going down over the last few years. There are 200,000. Uh, 20,000 um, 
homeless children in Chicago, most of them black. Ron Emanuel, the great Democratic mayor, not only has he done nothing about it, he does not permit, he, he goes along with the conspiracy of the CHA to keep $300 million in their treasury, for what purpose, I'm not sure, for some future political manipulation, which is more than enough money to house a total of 30,000 homeless, including 20,000 homeless children. The Democratic mayor, whom I suspect some of you voted for, is worse than uh, uh, a lot of the old Republicans. Um, uh, Pat Quinn betrayed his trust as a representative of the Democratic coalition. He started doing that before he was governor, uh, when he got rid of the three, uh, three uh, senator district. As a result of that three senator district uh, provision, we elected in Chicago Republicans like Elroy Sanquist Jr., who would be a dream to have now because he, was, he represented the interests of Chicago citizens, it's, it's, um, students, in the, in, the, um, in the councils of the Republican Party in Springfield, Pat Quinn recklessly destroyed that system. Then, on top of that, when he was running for re-election as governor, he, um, <clears throat> pardon me, my mind was right. Back, <laughs> he, 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 um, he supported the destruction of the pensions of uh, uh, over a hundred thousand uh, retirees and present employees of the state government. As a result, there was 150,000 senior citizens who voted straight Democratic ticket. They didn't vote for Pat Quinn. There was 100,000 150, 150, senior citizens who didn't vote at all, who normally vote Democratic. Uh, what Pat Quinn did was a violation of his trust as a representative of the Democratic coalition in the same way that a lawyer who falls asleep during the trial, that is grounds for reversing the decision of the trial, a lawyer who was not giving uh, his um, client adequate representation, which is guaranteed by the Constitution. Unfortunately, we don't apply that standard to our politicians. In short, you, I, I imagine most of you people have been supporting the Democrats. The Democrats have done more to destroy us because we, you vote for them. Why do you vote for them, people who keep $300 million in the CHA Treasury when we have 30,000 homeless, 20,000 of them children? That, that tells the story. You think this is a great country? This country? You're being bribed because you, all of your lives are barely comfortable anyhow. What? You're failing to consider there's 60 million people out of the labor force. They distort the, um, the unemployment statistic. If you stop applying for unemployment compensation, you're not counted as being unemployed. There's tens of millions of people who are unemployed who are not counted. This country is going down. The average wage is going down. How many more statistics do you want from me to tell you that this country is far in your comfort? Yeah, what about, what about the, uh, the 20,000 um, homeless children? What are you going to do about that? Thank you. Adjourn it, Sandy. Okay. Uh, final note, as we talked earlier, uh, please, and everyone, uh, please get up and head toward the back pretty quickly so that uh, the bus boys and the waitress can clean this place up in the next two minutes. Thank you very much, and we're adjourned for the night, and we will see you next week.